Miniature Realms is proudly sponsored by Income Gaming, Cheltenham's premier friendly local game store. Check the link in the description. Octan Panzer is soon on the way from Warlord Games and a few weeks ago they very kindly sent me the British Army Tank Force and a set of the rules to take a look at. You may well have recently seen a video short that I posted teasing my first painting tutorial and this is that. I'm planning a few videos on this game including painting tutorials to start with for the British Army Tank Force and then at the end around the time of release I will look at all my painted miniatures hopefully if things work out well timing wise and the rules and the cards and things as well. Now, because I received my miniatures pre-release, Warlord Games just sent me the standard bolt action sets for them, but the kits are the same in the starter set. And I built and primed this Humber, the subject of this first painting tutorial. I built it as a Mark IV, and he's primed black, ready to paint. Shortly after this, they kindly sent me copies of all the cards that I will receive in the British Army Tank Force, but also those from other nations as well, including some stowage packs and things. And we're basically being sent things as they arrive from the printers. So I'm not getting this full experience that I would do for opening that starter box and seeing it all inside, but it's been really fantastic to get these things ahead of time. And I really appreciate Warlord Games for sending them out to me. Now, I'm not going to give a detailed review at this stage of all of the cards and things in the box. I will save that to my final video in this little series when I look at it as a whole, including the finished tanks. But there are some other channels out there that are doing fantastic work with this. Martin over at the Seventh Sun channel has already done a battle report at the time that I'm recording this audio for this video. And Dom at Boots on the Table, I know, has also done a good flip through all of the card sets that I have here. And he's also done a battle report as well. And I have seen a number of others pop up in my feed on YouTube that I haven't had a chance to look at yet. So maybe you've already seen them, maybe you haven't. But I definitely recommend checking out those channels for that kind of content if that's what you're looking for. But here today, what I'm looking at is painting this Humber Mark IV and how you might go about it. So welcome to Miniature Realms. My name's Stuart. Let's get to the painting. Miniature Realms is proudly sponsored by Baron of Dice, premium wargaming dice. Over 500 styles, over 4,000 customer reviews. Welcome to the best dice on the planet. So as mentioned earlier on, I had built this little chap and painted him black, just with a normal rattle can. But my main colours for the model are going to be bronze green and Russian uniform. They're my colours for late war British that I often go to. But here I'm going to be using some leather brown surface primer from Vallejo first. Now, I'm not using this for its primer properties. I'm using this as a bit of an underpaint here. I wanted to provide a base for those greens to go on that wasn't just black. Black's quite a cold color and so are those greens. And I find that it looks a little bit dull and you have to build up the layers a bit too much. And I really like a nice brown undertone to a lot of my World War II tanks. So I've just found this is a really, really simple method. You don't have to do this. You can absolutely skip this stage. But I find that just by adding a few layers of brown in, and I am leaving some black as well here. This is almost like a zenithal style thing with a brown, which might seem a little bit bizarre. But just adding that thin layer through does filter through into the other colors when you apply them really, really in thin layers. Now, if you're not using an airbrush, you may well find this isn't quite as important. Or you could prime the whole miniature using a brown rattle can and then go and carry on with the same greens as I'm using, either with an airbrush or with a standard hairy brush. And you'll get a similar kind of effect as well. So work my way around. You'll notice that I'm adding a little bit lighter area towards the, the bottom panels of the tank here. This is a stylized thing that I like to do. It's kind of semi-stylized modulation. It's not full modulation. Again, some people don't like that. They prefer a flatter color. It's just something I like to do. It adds a little bit of shadow in later on. And it looks like the, the darker areas where you've got some overhangs where the light might catch more to, from a certain angle. Now, this obviously doesn't work scientifically all the way around the tank. It always assumes that you're looking at it from a side on angle and the lights coming down from just behind you but I do think it looks pretty cool. 
So now we're onto that first green from Model Color. It's bronze green, as I've mentioned before. I'm just gonna build this up in very, very thin layers. I've diluted this paint almost 50-50 in my airbrush with a little bit of thin, a little bit of water. And I'm just going very thinly over. And knowing I'm gonna cover most of this brown, but I'm aiming mostly where the brown is as well. We don't want too much sort of pure brown showing through, but I do want it to tint the green that I'm laying down and just warm it up a little bit. And as I start to go around the tank, you see that brown disappearing more and more. But where you do leave it in the in the crevices and the recesses and things like that, it also looks like it's sort of ingrained dirt and things. So it's, it's not a bad accidental effect to have on a tank, which is, let's face it, going to be pretty muddy, rolling through the fields of, of northern Europe in 1944. And exactly the same on the turret as well. And this is one of the things I really love about painting World War II tanks. Is they're not like their science fiction alternatives that you see at the moment, which I also have fun doing, but require a lot more colours when you're painting gun silver and adding lighting and glowing effects to the end. Everything is painted in the, the standard uh, uniform colour at the time, and it definitely speeds things up a lot. You can see that base layer of bronze green on there. It's quite dull at the moment. So now we reach for our Russian uniform and this is where it really starts to pop and you really see the difference of what we were trying to achieve there. And I think it's pretty striking. I love this Russian uniform green. I don't think you get quite the same effect unless you're applying it over the, the darker bronze green. I think the combination of the two and to have a transition between the two is what really, really works. And you'll see what I'm doing here is aiming in the center of panels or aiming towards the edge of panels. So you're leaving a little bit of that darker green into the recesses. And you're also leaving some of that brown, which is still very, very faintly visible as well. And the overall effect of all three paints really work together to produce a nice effect. If we just went straight with this Russian green here onto, onto the brack, it would work, of course, but it just wouldn't look anywhere near the same. It wouldn't have the same kind of tonal depth. So even on the top here, I'm trying to make sure that I don't go all the way into the edges that I'm applying in the center of the panels. And it really just adds to that sort of overall effect of the miniature. You've got that shadow in the recesses and it looks like the, the light is hitting the, the centers. Obviously the light wouldn't work like that at all. It would, would cover most of the top of the tank if it was directly down the, the way we're looking at the moment. But overall, when you move a miniature around, you're looking at it from lots of different angles and things. All you're doing is reinforcing the light that you'll naturally see in, in real life. And I think that using this kind of method works well for that. And then once we're done, I think that looks pretty cool. I think we got a pretty good late war-ish green. There are always variants, always discussions around what's the right methods to use. But I think that works for me and I'm very happy with it. Now, before we do the next stages, I want to use a gloss varnish. You don't have to do this, but I think it helps on a number of levels. Helps protect the miniature because we will be using some oil paints here. And while they're okay in moderation, if you're using a lot of them, they can sometimes take the paint back. But even more so here, I'm going to be applying decals and they always apply so much better. And you get a much smoother finish if you can apply them over a, a soft, glossy surface. And then my kit for applying decals is Micro Set and Micro Sol. They are absolutely fantastic. If you don't use them, you should. And I've got a sharp blade for cutting out my decals. And off camera, I have a Q-tip or earbud. I have an old brush. And then I'm using a little wet palette here. You can use, obviously, you can use a, a saucer or something with water in, which is the way I did it as a child. And just pop a little bit of um, tissue paper or something. If you do that, it stops the decals floating around too, too much. Um, and then all you really want to do is work out which decals you're going to use. There's lots of different eras on this one decal sheet. So you pick your theatre and do a little bit of research and then you check where they're going to be placed. Some decal sheets you will find that they all become individually and if you pop the whole thing in water, they'd all float separate. Some you require to cut the individual decal out, so it's worth having a close look at them first or doing a little test. And then what I tend to do is pop them face down first until it soaks and then I just flick it over. And I'm using this wet palette slightly wetter than I would if I was painting. Again, as I said, if you're using a saucer, pour enough water in a few mils so they would float and then I just put a layer of kitchen roll down to stop them floating around it makes a big big difference and in terms of markings I'm no super expert on it and I'm sure many of you watching 
this video know a lot about, more about World War II than I do. But what you've got included in, in this pack here is enough to do some late war and to do some desert as well and, and Polish theatre. But what I'm focusing on here for this Humber is making sure that I've got the Armoured Car Regiment symbol numbers on there and then making sure that I've got the, the squadron number. So I've chosen square, so that will be B squadron. And I will place them. I think where I place some of these, they're not always exactly where they should go. Sometimes they don't always fit, um, especially if you build everything and put all of your stowage and things on the miniatures. But the placement there for that uh, regiment numbered or division number is absolutely right. Um, uh, the one on the back, um, I have to put it in a slightly different place because I've already placed a, an, an oil can, a jerry can on, on the back. So don't worry too much. Uh, there will always be someone online that tells you you've done something wrong. As long as it looks pretty cool, that's the main thing. And for me, decals really do make a miniature like this look really cool, especially when you weather them up afterwards. There you see we've got the Allied Star on there as well. And we've got that B Squadron square, which is probably towards the back of that turret when it maybe should be towards the front. But again, I still think they look pretty cool and, and do what you want to do with your own miniatures. Now, I have got a video tutorial on applying decals, but very briefly here. First, you want to apply the micro set with a brush, a decal on top afterwards, get that in place, dry the excess off with a cotton bud or some kitchen roll, and then apply some micro sole. And the micro sole will really kind of set that in and blend it down into the, the miniature. And that's why you want a smooth surface as well. If you've got a porous surface, and you find that you won't get rid of the edges anywhere near as well. If you do, if you've got a smooth surface, head to the gloss varnish beforehand. Now we want to protect those decals afterwards because they will just scratch off, especially if we're putting oils and things on top. So it's a little bit more gloss varnish. As it's such a small area on this tank, I am just thinning it slightly with water and just brushing it on rather than setting up the whole airbrush again to do so. And that saves adding another thick layer of, of gloss over your whole miniature. So next up, I'm reaching for Iraqi Sand from Vallejo Model Color. And first off, I'm going to be using it for this stowage here, just painting it on all over the fabric areas. I'm trying to leave the actual straps in because they would be a khaki-ish kind of color, I believe. And it saves having to repaint them with something else. So I'm just taking my time to try and keep that as neat as possible. And then what I'm also doing is just painting this in where the wood areas would be on the tools on the side of the Humber. Now, Obviously, it wouldn't be this colour, it wouldn't be this bright colour, but I'm going to be using this as a base layer for an army painter speed paint in this case. And what that will do is it will save me time afterwards because I won't have to go back and highlight that army painter speed paint. Before we get to that speed paint, I'm going to paint in the metal parts of those tools with black metal from Scale Color, Scale 75. But this is essentially just a gun metal colour, so use whatever you have in your paint range. So I am reaching for some contrast, I think for the first time in this video, and this is Skeleton Horde. I thin this slightly, probably two parts Skeleton Horde to one part water. And I'm just applying this to the stowage at the side, allowing it to run in all those crevices, using it a little bit like a wash here. But then what I'll do afterwards is go back with my brush clean again and just make sure it's not pooling at all and take it off the flat surfaces because it will save time in going back and highlighting afterwards, especially as I'm going to be adding oil washes. It will get dull down anyway, so I don't want to waste time doing lots of kind of standard style highlighting on something that I won't need to anyway in the end. This is Army Painter Speed Paint 2.0 range hardened leather. I'm just applying this over the Iraqi sand that I painted in on the wooden handles of the tools. And what it does here, it just runs into those crevices and recesses, makes it look darker, and then you don't need to go back and highlight a, a brown. If you used a flat brown there, you'd have to go back and, and do another highlight, and I prefer to do it in reverse here. Seems to be a neater way of doing it. Add some shadow where it runs to the, the edges and things, and I just find it a more pleasing and quicker way of achieving the same thing. This is scale 75 or scale color standard black. Now, the reason I've reached for this is because I know that it's the most matte finish of all the blacks that I have in my collection at the moment. I know there are some fantastic, really matte blacks out there, especially from the AK range and from the Vallejo range for some rubber paints and things as well. Um, they're all equally good. Reach for your best option for this. This is my best option out of the ones I had. And when it does dry, as I said, it's so matte and so sort of dry and dusty finish almost. It just it really kind of works for this kind of miniature. 
And there we have the tank with all of its base layers done, all of its decals on and sealed. And it's pretty cool. Apart from being slightly shiny, you could absolutely game with it. But we're going to use grease and dark mud oil washes from Soilworks, which is Scale Colors or Scale 75's own ready mix range. What I'm doing here is a mixture of both colors, the dark first off, and then I'll add in the grease later on. It's a bit of a pin wash. I'm going around the edges of areas, but I'm not worrying too much if it bleeds out because this is an oil wash and it's on a gloss surface. It's going to be super easy to clean up and tidy up afterwards. Um, and this is just my go to method now for this kind of miniature instead of using washes, which are slightly problematic at times unless you're incredibly accurate with them. And this way you can be a little bit lazy and slop it on around the edges, knowing that it's running into all those gaps and, and crevices and things and, and knowing how easy it's going to be to clear up afterwards and then when it does dry not only does it shadow because it's an oil paint it's got a very matte finish it's got a kind of dusty finish and it looks like ingrained dirt in, in all the places that you'd have ingrained dirt on a tank and before anyone comments yes i know this is an armored car not a tank but the same methods and processes apply to both if you are interested in learning more about these kind of techniques or any of the kind of techniques you see in any of my videos, I do offer online tuition via my Patreon. The top two tiers both offer some online tuition with me and you can pretty much work on anything you'd like to. So maybe in this instance, it might be weathering using oil washes or airbrushing or something like that. And I can demonstrate things to you and I can also watch what you're doing and offer feedback and help. If the in-person thing isn't quite your thing, then I also offer a text option, which is a little bit cheaper as well. You can message me at any time in your own private Discord channel and we will chat and you can share pictures. And I can give you feedback and so on. And if you'd like to support the channel in other ways without having tuition, then the, the bottom a couple of tiers of the Patreon are very much just a thank you and access to certain areas of early videos and that kind of thing. And I also have a fantastic Discord, which is super, super friendly. You can get lots of help from other people there and while there's a little private area for patron members it's also just a great place to hang out so as i've been rambling on about my patron you'll notice i've been working my way around this little armored car continuing to add both colors of oil wash into all the crevices around the wheels anywhere that's got a bit of shadow really bolts and nuts and things like that and i've also been adding some streaks as well from top to bottom in the direction of where rainwater might flow and as i tidy this up in the next stage you'll see how that really comes to life so this is why i reach for the artist white spirit and you really do want the artist stuff or santador because they are far less horrible smelling than the the stuff you get in your local diy store will be not only will that be too strong and may will cause your paint to peel back it'll also upset your family members your pets and all the other things in the house as you fill the house for the smell of turpentine so what i'm doing here is trying to take away some of the larger areas of oil paints i left it deliberately messy and and this is where we do the tidying up and the joys of oil paints is you can use the clean white spirit here just to clean it away again so you'll see what i've done those little streaks what i'm here now doing is just thinning them out going in at the edges taking away any of the thick lines and the big blotches and just turning it into little streaks and as that dries what you end up is something that looks like rain streaks or dirt streaks so that are down the side of the little armor car in this instance and it really makes a difference you can also use things like this cotton bud here or q-tip if you're from other parts of the world just to take away some of those bigger pools take it away and then go back in with a clean brush as well now you could take 99 percent of the oil paints back off because it takes so long to fully dry and set probably 24 hours at that minimum to fully set now they'll be touch dry within a couple of hours especially these ready mixed types like these from the scale color range if you mix your own oil paints from from artist oil paints they're an incredibly great way of doing it i do a lot of my work that way i do find they take a little bit longer to dry but if you've got the time you can definitely get a lot more from your money from mixing your own and you'd mix it with the same white spirits that you, you see me here using to clean it off it just takes a little bit of time and practice to work out the thicknesses for different kinds of job and there are a whole host of other little techniques you can do if you have pure artist white spirit but that's for another video but anyway i'll work, keep working my way around this little humber armored car here taking away any pulling taking it off from the flat center of any panels and just really smoothing out any of these streaks so they look like rain deposits and, and mud streaks rather than just where i've gone a bit blotchy with a wash 
Here you see everything is much toned down now, much more subtle. It's still in all those recesses. And we're going to fix it now. We're going to use some matte varnish. Now, I have let this dry for about six or seven hours. And then I'm working some matte varnish over the top. Now, ideally, I'll wait a little bit longer. I don't always have time to do that, especially when I'm creating videos. But I found it was plenty enough dry to do this. So thin this matte varnish using it through my airbrush. You could use a rattle cam. Rattle can sprays and varnishes are often very, very thick. I'd say too thick for miniatures in many ways. You will start obscuring the details. Um, but there we are. Once the matte varnish is dry, it just takes away any of that remaining shine from the gloss varnish that was used to protect the miniature. And then you can see that detail more because the light's not reflecting off it anymore. And I think we, we're almost there here. It's looking pretty cool. One of the final touches I like to do is add a little bit of silver chipping. I'm using Game Air Silver here. I'm going to be using a mixture of dry brushing here, very, very gentle, just where paint might work away because of being worn. Maybe it's been chipped from stones coming up. Maybe it's ammunition shells or something or other flying against the side. So I don't want to go too much. I'm just hitting the edge of the jerry cans here. The very corners of the, the metals where it may have brushed against things. It's out on campaign here. They're not painting it in between. Just a little bit here and there. And it just really kind of makes it pop. This is an optional extra. It really, really is. It's not something you definitely have to do, but I just like the way it looks for doing it. So if you like the look of it, go for it. If you prefer it the way it was, you can leave it as it is. So this is a Vallejo pigment. This is light sienna, and it's a kind of a dusty light brown color. It's not really the color of mud, really, but it's the color of dry mud, I believe, in some instances. And I just really like the way it looks. And I'm just brushing it in dry here into the wheels and the tires, and I will blow off the excess. Now, you can seal this if you want to. It just drastically changes the coloring of it. And when it dries again, you'll look like there's far less on there. In my experience from doing this for a number of years now, if you blow off the excess, and just leave it where it's brushed into the detail it just stays there and I wouldn't worry about it too much now I'm using some Vallejo mud effects this is European mud and this is rather than their basing texture this is actually a mud effect you could use this as basing texture but it takes a lot longer to to kind of fill up a base or something this when it dries it, it dries a little bit um, more translucent um, and the fibers come through it's got some chunky fibers in there so it just looks like wet mud it's brilliant the thicker you build it up the wetter it will look if you only put a few dabs here and there you'll find that it kind of looks like a little bit of dried on mud so it's all about the volumes that you want to create here but this just really really adds the nice finishing touches for me and there we have it, one finished Humber Mark IV armoured car, and I just love it. It's such a cool little model, and I think it looks quite good as well. I think those are fairly simple techniques. I appreciate those of you who don't use an airbrush will have to tone down some of the earlier stages, but even if you used a flat olive green rattle can, you could copy most of the rest and do it with a standard brush. But I, I really like the way it's come out, and I'm really looking forward to painting the rest of the starter army. I think the plan as it stands will be to do a full tutorial for the M10 and then just show off the painted versions of the, the Churchill tanks. I may do it the other way around. I probably won't do a full tutorial for them both because I'll be using the same greens as you've seen here and using the same techniques. I think by tutorial number three, um, you will find that's quite repetitive. There are some differences to tanks, especially tracks and things like that. So it's definitely worthwhile me doing another detailed tutorial for one of those tanks. And I've never painted an M10, so I think Think that's probably going to be the one I go for but the aim will be to get the four remaining tanks painted ready for the launch and then do a bit of a run through of that whole starter set and give my thoughts on the game overall. Let me know your thoughts on this little Humber Mark IV. What do you think of it? Are you going to use any of the techniques on your own armies or own miniatures? Do you use something different? I'd love to hear the way different people paint their tanks. And if it's made you interested in Octo and Panzer from Warlord Games, um, it will be out relatively soon, I think. Not too much longer to wait for those of us who are excited and lots of people have placed pre-orders already. If you haven't already pre-ordered, I do have an affiliate link with Warlord Games that will be in the video description you obviously don't have to use that but it's a great way of showing support for the channel if you choose to do so but most importantly if you've enjoyed the video just subscribe to the channel like the video comments those are the things that really let me know that you've enjoyed the video and the support I get most from so thank you very much for watching if you have already watched to this stage 
as I've already mentioned, the channel has a Discord now. It's a really, really friendly place. You can talk about any miniature war game in existence. There's lots of different channels on there for you to chat away to your heart's content. And I will be around to do a little bit of painting advice and things on there as well. If you're a Patreon member, you get a few little extras, I've already said. And then we have this really fun thing called Monthly Hobby Pledge, where everyone sets out their goals or what they want to paint for the month ahead and, and to see if they can achieve it. It's all a bit of fun and patrons can earn dice throughout the year by doing so as well. Thank you very much for watching. Thank you again to all my patrons for your support. Take care and I'll catch you soon.